tell you about the un- unknown and the unidentified flying object? Oh, yes. We discussed it at every conference that we had with the military, and they never had been, a- never were able to make me a concrete report on it. Do you have anything on the subject, sir? No, I haven't, I haven't anything on the subject. And it, they, there's always things like that going on. The flying saucers and we've had other things, you know. For years, the world has seen reality distorted. Facts manipulated. And truth hidden. But there's even more to the story than anyone has ever suspected. Because no one has been able to see the whole picture. Until now. Friends, welcome back and we are live. Uh, Welcome back to another episode of the Unexplained Rundown. I'm your host, Grant Levac, and if you found this channel intentionally then like me, you're intrigued by the unexplained mysteries of this mortal coil of ours, and you crave to know what's real and what's not. So wherever you are around the world, I really appreciate you taking some time out of your morning, if you're down under, or your evening, if you're uh, across the pond. Uh, I've got a couple of folks in the chat that are already joining, so let's say hello to a few. Uh, Jimmy, always good to see you, my brother. Thank you for taking some time out of your early Tuesday Melbourne morning uh, to, to join me. Uh, We've also got um, Mark McHiggins with us. Welcome, Mark. Thanks for taking some time out of your day. Mark's Shed Talk. Uh, I'm not sure if I've seen you in the chat before, Mark Shed Talk. So thanks for taking some time to join me. We've also got Jasmine Chirac in the the house. So thank you for uh, for being here. Brian Kelly, good to see you. Colin UAP Aotearoa. Always good to see you as well, my friend. So uh, thanks for taking some time to join me for today's uh, live stream. It's a um, lot to cover in today's show. So obviously, I wanted to uh, do a, a bit of a November update for everyone. Uh, obviously, give you a bit of a rundown of what's been happening in the Australian press on the uh, on the UAP topic. So got quite a bit to cover off on in today's session. But before we get into it, all. Um, if you haven't yet subscribed to the channel and you want to follow my journey on the UAP topic, please feel free to subscribe. Consider subscribing. Uh, if you want to give this video one of these, a thumbs up, a like, share it with your friends. It will help uh, a lot with the uh, help help the channel grow significantly. So if you appreciate and value the work that I do to try and uh, get answers on what Australia is doing or not doing on the UAP topic, uh, consider that like, share, subscribe. So let's get into it. Uh, I've got a bit of a slide deck that I'll share in today's session. Oh, by the way, too, if you want to uh, subscribe on, to the channel on YouTube, you can. There are now uh, YouTube memberships available as well as uh, Patreon. So if you want to support the show above and beyond a like, share, subscribe, please feel free. Uh, quick word of thanks to my solo Patreon member, uh, Jimmy Sikowski. Thanks for uh, your Patreon patronage, your Patreon membership, my friend. Uh, I appreciate your support. So let's get into it. Uh, Let me show my screen so you can see what we're going to cover off on in today's session. So we'll start with the rundown, kind of give you a sense as to what's been what's been reported on in the UAP UFO topic uh, down under. And the one that is really, I guess, significant for us today, and it's really the theme of, uh, of today's show, is you know, the Australian news media, it looks like they're starting to get serious on uh, on the UAP topic. And I say that because, uh, let me just pull up the right screen here. There we go. Because it was only uh, recently that the Canberra Times, which is the uh, national, I guess, or the, the, the leading newspaper for uh, Australia's, uh, our our nation's capital, the Australian Capital Territory. So the Canberra Times published an article on the 22nd of October, uh, really challenging the Australian Department of Defence's complete lack of interest and complete lack of action on the UAP topic. So before I uh, go through a bit of a read through of this article, uh, I'll just kind of give you a bit of background as to how it all came about. So 
So Jamison Murphy, he is a journalist. Uh, he reached out to me in early October. He had seen the petition that I'd submitted with the House of Representatives, uh, and he reached out to me and uh, informed me that he was keen to do an article on UAP in an Australian context, which I found very, very encouraging. So I provided him with a ton of uh, background information and actually referred him to, to Ross Coulthard, who we all who we all know, uh, for some uh, additional supporting commentary. So uh, thankfully, Jamison was able to take a lot of that information that I provided and talk, obviously, when he spoke with Ross, to put together what I believe is probably the, the most serious and, and best um, article that I've seen to date um, covering the UAP UFO topic in an Australian context. Because a lot of the articles that have been do done thus far they're all a bit of a fluff. They're all a bit of copy and paste uh, out of directly what's coming out of the United States. And credit to news outlets that are covering the topic. But this is the first one that I've seen to date, uh, going back as really as far as I can recall, uh, that is really getting serious on Australia's silence on the UAP topic and the silence is deafening. So um, let me, I'll turn the uh, screen share off because I want to actually show you, if I can turn it off here, there we go. So the Canberra Times, uh, it's been around, so long paper, it's been around since 1928, and it has a readership, their weekend readership, so their Sunday newspaper has reached about 49,000 people, and so I actually have relatives down in Canberra, and they were quite nicely able to uh, send me a hard copy of the Canberra Times itself. Uh, and to my absolute surprise and delight, on page four of the newspaper, you actually have this uh, incredible double page spread. It's a bit hard to see there, and I'm going to... So the truth is out there, Australia accused of treating UFO threat as piss take. And, you know, there's a few uh, images in the, uh, in the article uh, that were kind of just added for... Um, I guess a little bit of uh, a bit of appetite for the audience, but the 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 context and the commentary in the article uh, I feel is pretty significant. So let me let me walk you through it. I'm going to pull up the article so we can actually have a look at it and read through it together. Uh, now there we go. Uh, now I'm just going to cite here fair use and fair dealings. Obviously, this is a transformative work. We're educating the public and we're critiquing the article that we're showing. Uh, the one thing that was unfortunate about this Canberra Times article is that it was hidden behind a paywall. Uh, so you had to be a subscriber of the Canberra Times in order to read it. Unfortunate, uh, but that's the way it is. So I subscribed to the Canberra Times. Uh, I'm still a subscriber. That's why I'm able to see the article. And uh, let's go through it. So often what the Canberra Times will do is they'll have one title for the hard copy and then they'll adjust the title to uh, uh, you know, to cater to, I guess, their digital audience. So the, the digital title of the same article, Australia ignores US Five Eyes UAP briefing as defence mocks UAPs. So uh, Jamison Murphy published this off, obviously on Sunday, the 22nd of uh, October. Uh, and let's go through it. I won't play the video because it's um, it's it's pretty stock standard. We've all seen it. Just covering the uh, the gimbal incident, uh, the comment, the the tag. Though a former intelligence officer testified under oath that the U.S. government is in possession of UFOs and non-human bodies. So it kind of gives a bit of a a visual brief of what's been going on. So let's go through this article together. So Australia ignored the United States-led Five Eyes meeting on UFOs despite the US labeling the issue as a national security threat. And senior Australian defense personnel have been caught mocking the subject while preparing briefing notes freedom of information documents have revealed. Uh, Australia's approach to unidentified aerial or what we now know as anomalous phenomena, UAP, uh, phenomenon, he's indicated there, the contemporary term for UFOs is completely out of step with its closest military ally, leading to calls for the for the federal government and Australian Defence Force to review its UAP policy, which was officially cancelled uh, a decade ago. 
Since 2021, the US has attempted to destigmatize the topic, and they've included links in the article, which is good, by acknowledging UAPs represented a hazard to safety of flight and pose a possible adversary threat and heightening its level of surveillance with mandatory UAP reporting for defense personnel. So uh, I've got a couple of um, other documents to showcase as we go through it. So it's not, not going to be a complete read through. I'll just add some commentary uh, as we go through. The US government has also held multiple congressional hearings and commissioned several reports while the Pentagon has created a, divi a new division dedicated to researching UAPs, all without making judgments on whether they are extraterrestrial, the advanced technology of another nation or something else. However, there are no plans within the Australian Defence Force to follow its closest ally or implement reporting mechanisms for pilots, despite FOI documents showing the Chief of Air Force has been briefed on US policy change. Direct quote, while I understand foreign governments have released documentation regarding UAP, this is a matter for their governments as sovereign entities, uh, I think there's a typo there, will not impact Australia's decisions on this matter, acting head of Air Force capability, Air Commodore Ben Sleeman wrote. So that quote is taken directly from a response that I received uh, from the Air Force. I had originally reached out to the Minister for Defence, uh, Defense, current Deputy Prime Minister Richard Miles, uh, making some inquiries as to, well, did Australia attend the Five Eyes Forum uh, on UAP in, in May of this year? And if I pull up, so this was the, this was the response letter that I received. Uh, this was on the 30th of June of this year. And so this is the this is the quote that's that's highlighted there, uh, while I understand foreign governments have released. So this was the response that I received from the acting head of Air Force Capability, Ben Sleeman, uh, on Australia's position on unidentified anomalous phenomena. The key elements are highlighted there. Uh, essentially, the acting head of Air Force Capability is coming back to my inquiries and saying, we continue to assess that there is no scientific or other compelling reason to divert resources to the reporting recording investigation of UAP. This is reflective of the Australian government's position on the matter. Well, when you say we continue to assess, well, what assessments, what data-driven data -driven assessments have you done since 1996 to uh, understand the extent and the and nature of UAP and more importantly, the potential national security threats and safety of flight risk that UAP pose? Because you haven't investigated the topic since 1996. And when I and many others have asked for documentation to, ver to uh, verify that claim that you continue to assess. We haven't seen any assessments that you've conducted to date. They also in this uh, letter responded that uh, specifically to my inquiry as to, um, as to whether the Deputy Prime Minister, Minister of Defence Richard Miles had been briefed on UAP and if uh, Australia attended the Five Eyes Forum on UAP, the response that's highlighted upon them, I, confirm, I can confirm that Air Force has not delivered any briefings to the Deputy Prime Minister or on the matter of UAP. Well, why the hell haven't you? Air Force did not attend the Five Eyes Forum on UAP as the Five Eyes Foreign Material and uh, or the Five Eyes Foreign Material Program mentioned in your correspondence. And that pertains to uh, Larry Maguire, MP, Canadian MP, his letter to the Minister for Defence in Canada. So just wanted to kind of give you a bit of, um, bit of reference there as to that quote uh, from uh, that's included in the uh, in the article, so let me come back to the deck because I'll continue on. Uh, actually, I sh should say I'll continue on with the um, the article. There we go, and we'll keep reading on. Now I don't know why they've included uh, a photograph of Dr. Stephen Greer here. Does it? Uh, add or lessen the credibility of the article. I don't believe it does, but it's a, a strange choice that they decided to include uh, Dr. Stephen Greer in one of his briefings, but they did nonetheless. The documents also reveal Australia did not attend the Five Eyes Forum on UAPs in May this year. And again, we know that Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick of ARA, and we'll get into him later today, uh, at NASA's public meeting on UA UAP with the independent study team on the 31st of May, he announced he revealed to the world that he had just held his an inaugural Five Eyes Forum on UAP, the Five Eyes being the US, uh, Canada, the UK, Australia, and New Zealand. 
so uh, the documents also reveal Australia did not attend the Five Eyes Forum on UAPs in May this year to discuss how to better collaborate with the data they collect on the phenomenon. And the big question why, uh, the big question that I have is why didn't Australia attend the Five Eyes Forum on UAP? And we'll get into that as we go through today as well. The US-led Intelligence Alliance, as we've kind of just alluded to, consists of the United Kingdom, Australia, Canada, and New Zealand. The Canadian and New Zealand governments confirmed that they had defence personnel can attend uh, the UAP forum. So we know that thanks to the good reporting, the good work that Daniel Otis has done out of Canada, that the Canadian armed uh, forces were represented at the Five Eyes Forum on UAP. And we know from the reporting of Defence Scoop, courtesy of Brandy Vincent, that um, uh, a New Zealand Defence Force representative based in Washington, D.C., uh, attended that Five Eyes Forum uh, that was held at the Pentagon in May. Uh, so that's the Canadian and New Zealand governments confirmed that they had defence personnel attend, should say, rather than attended, attend the UAP Forum. The Royal Australian Air Force stopped collecting reports of UAPs in 1996 after determining there was no scientific or other compelling reason to continue to devote resources to the recording and investigation of UAP. So that was back in 1996. Fast forward to you know, coming up on 30 years, 27 years or whatever it is. Uh, it's, we live in a very different world than what we did in 1996 on this topic. The landscape of the UAP UFO topic is very, very is vastly different from all those decades ago. So why the Royal Australian Air Force hasn't got off its ass and think, well, maybe we should uh, get a census to what is keeping US Congress up at night and the US Department of Defense and seek a briefing on UAP. But all uh, records, all documents seem to indicate that they have not. RAF says there are still pathways for personnel to report unusual or un unexpected events including those potentially posed by UAPs through the RAF aviation safety reporting procedures. So my understanding is that, and I've gone through the Defence uh, Aviation Safety Authority's regulations. So the Defence uh, Aviation Safety Authority has an act in place. The, the law, the legislation, there's also a regulation which documents how the law uh, is going to be, you know, how it's essentially to be, uh, to, to be carried out. And I have not seen anywhere in DAS's regulation the or the DASR, the Defence Aviation Safety Regulation, I've not seen anywhere in that regulation anything pertaining to, um, you know, reporting uh, of uh, observations of UAP. Obviously, there is reporting, mandatory reporting in place for uh, uh, air safety, flight worthiness, safety of flight related issues, uh, but if they, if if an if an aviator or pilot wit witnesses or observes an aircraft or an object that they're not able to identify in Australian airspace, they're not obligated to report it unless uh, that object represents a safety of flight risk. Uh, and it so if they see a UAP which could become a safety of flight risk. If they see a UAP, but it's not an immediate safety of flight hazard, there's no risk of a near miss or a potential collision, there's no requirement to report that observation. They're only required to report, and there's voluntary reporting uh, in the uh, in the, the regulation, a, a certain document, it's called the DSR, DASR Form 44, an occurrence report. They only uh, are required to report or submit a voluntary report if they see, if they observe a UAP again, and it happens to then become a safety of flight risk. So if they see a UAP and it doesn't represent an immediate hazard uh, and it then just disappears, well, they don't have to report it. It's only if the uh, current, the, the observation uh, repeats and it becomes a safety of flight risk. So it's, it's ridiculous that there is, you know, no reporting for aviators and pilots if they see something that they can't reconcile or clearly identify in the sky. Because what if it is a foreign adversary? Or what if it is uh, a, uh, a, you know, a, a high altitude balloon like the Chinese spy balloon that, you know, sailed across the continental United States and uh, wasn't shot down until it done a full pass over the uh, the entire country. So, you know, it's, it's concerning that there are no sensible see something 
reporting mechanisms currently in place for defence personnel. Uh, and I cover that in detail, the Defence Aviation Safety Regulation in detail in, uh, in one of my previous videos. So if you're interested, check that out. You, uh, you certainly can. However, defence personnel are fearful of ridicule and they have no recorded RAF reports in 20 years. So they're fearful of ridicule because we know that defence personnel, those that are posi in, a, in positions of leadership, are taking the piss out of the topic. They're not taking it seriously. Case in point, I'll show you a document that I was able to secure through the Freedom of Information Act. Um, this was going back last year, I believe, and I've shown this before in, in other videos I've done, but this is a uh, an email chain uh, following the, you know, I believe the congressional hearing in May of last year, you know, this is uh, around about that time, 13th of May. So I think it was actually after, um, in the lead up to the, the, the congressional hearing on UAP in May of last year, highlighted, sir, all jokes aside, so I don't have the rest of the thread of this email, so I don't know what the prior commentary was, but all jokes aside, I think this might end up causing us some work, you know, having to you know, read up on what's going on in the US with, uh, with respect to UAP. The response, just highlighting that, and this is from Defense Department of Defense, uh, FOI uh, 003 2223. This was response, redacted, you're right, it may trigger more UFO flavored interest. The truth is out there. I just need to determine if this interest is, uh, if interest in this sci-fi science fiction is a head of head of air force capability or defense space command lead so clearly they just don't want to touch the the subject they're just quite happy to make jokes and ridicule take the piss out of it and why would defense personnel want to come forward uh and you know share their account of an observation of a uap if that's the kind of uh mindset that is being uh, you know that it, that is is current within the Department of Defense. That there's there is no uh, they would have no appetite or motivation to come forward and share uh, any observation they've had of UAP. And you know that's concerning because uh, I think that's where the real potential national security threat lies. If you've got defense personnel that are seeing something in Australian airspace that they cannot reconcile. Uh, and it's anomalous or it's not anomalous, and they're choosing not to report it out of fear of stigma, reprisal, being ostracized, that's a massive problem because what if it is a Chinese spy balloon? And we know that China has surveilled Australia significantly. There's some reporting came out this year saying that they're uh, going hard on surveilling what's happening over Pine Gap and other parts of Australia. Uh, so yeah, if it is foreign adversarial, and folks aren't reporting an observation of an object they can't identify in the sky, that is a real problem. That in itself is a potential national security threat. And Ross Coulthard, we know uh, when I had him on this podcast back in uh, August of this year, you know, he's saying that he's got defense personnel that are coming to him and sharing their accounts of observations that they're having in Australian airspace with some real concerns that they can't go to their superiors and report what they're seeing out of fear of being ostracized or ridiculed or having a blemish uh, placed on their flight record. So why would defense personnel want to come forward and uh, and talk about a sighting that they've had? It doesn't surprise me then that the Royal Australian Air Force is saying, oh, we haven't had any reports of unidentified aircraft in the last 20 years. No wonder what motivation is there for people to report it. And you currently don't have any reporting or, or recording protocols in place. Zero. And we know that Ryan Graves at the House Oversight Committee hearing on UAP uh, only recently said that in the US, anecdotally, he believes that there's only 5% reporting. So 95% of what's being seen by military personnel in the US is going unreported. We have zero reporting mechanisms in place. So it's no surprise that we're not getting any reports submitted. And if they are reports submitted, what would happen to them anyway? There's no follow-up. The concern appears to be well-placed. FOI documents show while the world's most advanced military is taking UAP seriously, the ADF, Australian Defence Force, is still joking about it. And this goes to the email I just showed you. You're right. It may trigger more UFO-flavoured interest. The truth is out there. I'll just need to determine if this is sci-fi, if 
if the, if interest in this sci-fi uh, is ahead of Air Force capability or Defense com uh, Space Commander lead, a heavily redacted email between Defense Star stated. The article then goes on to quote uh, Ross Coulthard. Ross Coulthard is an Australian investigative journalist and one of the world's leading UFO, UAP investigators. Almost every week he gets calls. He gets a call from Australian defence pilots who have seen something they can't explain, yet don't feel comfortable reporting through official channels or to their superiors. And this goes to what I was talking about just a second ago. It's not that somebody's telling them not to report it. It's purely and simply that there's a residual stigma in both civilian and military aviation that if you report this stuff, it could jeopardise your career, Mr. Coulthard said. Most of the concern is it's a piss take. Everybody laughs at UFOs because everybody automatically associates it with little green men, which is 100% correct, and the things that have been ridiculed and mocked for the last 70 years. The weird thing about it is not... What any uh, the weird thing about it is that's not what anybody's talking about. All people are saying is that there is a phenomenon that is a real mystery. Many of Australia's closest allies have acknowledged the unknown aerial phenomenon, including the UAK, the UK, Canada, France, and Spain. We know that the UK had the uh, the was the Condine report some decades ago. Canada has now got. Um, was it Sky Project in Canada, a scientific investigation into the UAP phenomena in their country? We know France has done some detailed investigation on the subject in the past. I don't personally know about the work Spain has done, but clearly uh, from that alone, that would suggest that UAP is not an issue that's isolated to just the United States, particularly if other countries are taking it seriously and have done their homework on it. And Australia as well. Australia has almost as long as a history as the US investigating UAP, dating back to the 1950s through to 1996. Uh, the, goes, the article goes on to quote Ross and saying, Australia is quite anomalous in the sense that it's basically not taking the subject seriously. Uh, Mr. Coulthard said, we've got this weird cognitive dissonance between what the Pentagon and other nations officially acknowledge. They regard this as an extremely real phenomenon, and they're puzzled as to why Australia isn't engaging more. They're ignoring the fact that there's an abundance of new evidence that's come to light in the last four years, which shows, which shows that this is not something to be ridiculed. And again, we know that Australia has absolutely no interest in the UAP topic because uh, again, another document that I was able to secure for release through the Freedom of Information Act last year is this one, the most significant document that, that's come out of the uh, Australian Department of Defence in the last 25 years. Chief of Air Force brief on unidentified aerial phenomena. And really the key elements that hit home in this brief uh, is, I believe it's highlighted, a talking point. As an ally, have the United States offered to or asked to collaborate on UAP investigations? No, this is at the time of the publication of this in, uh, I believe, May of last year. No, the United States nor any other nation or ally have requested or offered to collaborate on the UAP reporting or investigation. Well, we know now we now know that they have, courtesy of the Five Eyes Forum on UAP that was led by Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick in May. But this is the key one. Defense has no desire to seek collaboration on this issue. Why? Why don't you have any desire to seek collaboration? Wouldn't you want to know about the domain awareness gap that the US has reported time and time again? Uh, it just mind boggles me that there's just complete, you know, he heads buried in the sand on the UAP topic from Australia. This is also uh, a, key, a key point. It actually acknowledges in this document uh, wherever I can see it, uh, find it here. I believe it might even be on the next page. Uh, I'm not sure where. It, basically, in, in one of these documents, they go to say that you know, UAP do represent a clear safety of flight risk or, or flight hazard. So again. You know, Australia is just burying its head in the sand, towing the line that it's towed since 1996, 
just saying that you know no it's, it's not it's not a problem that uh, that affects australia and we'll talk more about that as we go through continues on and this is where um i was fortunate enough to get some uh, some some commentary included uh, in the in the article grant levac an australian civilian uap researcher has submitted an e petition with 700 and six, 750 signatures to the albanese government calling on it to review its unusual aerial sightings policy that was the vernacular that the Royal Australian Air Force used for many, many years, uh, unusual aerial sightings as opposed to UFO or unidentified aerial phenomena back in the day. Uh, to review its unusual aerial sightings policy, uh, calling on it to review its unusual aerial sightings policy, which was last reviewed in 2003 and cancelled in 2013. While the US has recognised the matter as a national security issue, which they've stated time and time again, and flight safety risks, which they've also stated time and time again, Mr. Levac said Australia was not even prepared to acknowledge the topic, let alone investigate it. Unfortunately, Australia is where the United States was about five or 10 years ago. I would say even further, probably you know, 10 to 20 years ago. Those emails, the, the one with the joke included, those emails clearly indicate that folks in positions of leadership within RAF are just taking the piss out of the issue. They're not taking it seriously. They're treating it like science fiction and making jokes about it. Walls of stigma and ridicule have long played this topic. The U.S. is treating this as a national security threat and a flight safety risk, but those concerns are completely being downplayed in Australia. Mr. Levac's petition also calls for sensible see-something-say-something reporting mechanisms for ADF, Australian Defence Force personnel. They need to be confident they can report something they can't readily identify and not feel like they're going to be ostracised or ridiculed for coming forward, he said. And again, that's backed up by comments that Ross Coulthard has made with defence personnel that have reached out to him with some real concerns. The e-petition is with the government and the minister, Minister for Defence, is required to respond. The FOI documents show Deputy Prime Minister and Defence Minister Richard Miles uh, ha has not been briefed by defence on UAPs. Again, incredibly concerning that the leader of the Australian Department of Defence is not aware of at least we're, that's the sense that we have publicly, is not aware of this UAP issue. When, <laughs> And we'll talk more about Richard Miles in just a moment. Mr. Coulthard said the Australian government still held a residual stigma attitude towards the phenomenon. Um, and I believe that's probably why there's still a lot of members of parliament and Australian senators that have not um, you know, voiced uh, their concerns over... UAP in an Australian context, or they haven't publicly shown their support for Senator Wish Wilson out of fear of, you know, touching this topic is maybe still political suicide. I would say to them, just look at Senator Wish Wilson's record, though. He just got re-elected last year, and he's been talking about UAP since October of 2021. So I think the fear that MPs and senators have on this topic uh, is, is unfounded. Uh, I don't think, you know, if, if they actually had the courage and gumption to talk about it and, and follow Senator Wish Wilson's lead, I think they'd probably find their constituents are supportive of their advocacy as well. None of us are saying it's aliens. The simple fact is we just acknowledged there is a phenomenon that cannot be explained. That's the official position of the United States government, Mr. Coulthard said. And that's exactly what we want the position of the Australian government to be. Acknowledge that a phenomenon exists, investigate it, so don't you know, uh, we want you to investigate the unexplained, not explain the uninvestigated, to quote uh, George Knapp. The US acknowledged that it's a threat to flight safety because there's been near collisions with these objects. And again, we know that the House Oversight Committee hearing on UAP uh, a few months ago, they stated that the near collision counts now up to 14. There have been f up to 14 near misses with UAP. Um, because there's been near collisions with these objects, whatever they are. So bearing that in mind, it's irresponsible for Australia to not at least attempt to collect data. That is the key. That is 100% on the money from, from Ross uh, on that quote, uh, that quote. And that's where the article ends, uh, and there is quite a few comments. So, uh, again, um, you know, it doesn't really get into any of the David Grush commentary because I don't think the Australian government is even in a position to um, have their ears open to hear anything of that nature. They haven't even acknowledged that the phenomenon 
exists. So if they're not even prepared to acknowledge the phenomenon and have a conversation on it, what chance, they've got none of Buckley's chance of, uh, of taking David Grush's allegations seriously. So I think that this is very much the angle that needs to be taken for the Australian government to take it seriously, position and, you know, reiterate and uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the national security threats and safety of flight risk issues. Once they formally acknowledge the topic and they start to investigate it, then I think it opens up the conversation to be had on some of the other claims that have been made. So, um, you know, it, again, I would say um, from my perspective, the, the most um, serious article that I've at least seen to date in Australia on the topic, at least from uh, a, uh, a perspective that challenges the Australian Department of Defence's long-held position uh, and inaction on, on UAP. So uh, I've put a link to the article in the show notes below. So if you want to subscribe to the Canberra Times and read that again, you can. Otherwise, you can just uh, you can just go over this recording. So that kind of leads us into, and I know there's been um, quite a few comments that have come through. So so let me uh, jump over to a few that have come through thus far. I want to give you a chance to get your voice heard. Uh, many thanks, Mark. Yes, uh, for those of you that just joined, if you do want to uh, share the good word about uh, this channel, please like, share, subscribe. If uh, if you haven't subscribed, please consider doing so. Uh, thank you for your comments. Telekinetic, great work, Grant. Excellent analysis, super vital right now. Uh, Ross McLeod, damn bit late, but howdy all. Welcome. Thanks for joining. Mark McHiggins. Comments, NATO did a three-year investigation in 1964 into UFOs over Europe. So again, backs up commentary that it's certainly not uh, isolated to the United States. And why Australia is still in that mindset is uh, is quite puzzling and very frustrating as well. So let's soldier on. I want to now uh, switch gears and, and talk about, I guess, a few things that are important with this headline. Australia ignores US Five Eyes UAP briefing. So we know, you know, following questions that Senator Wish Wilson asked of the Australian Department of Defence in June, in July, Department of Defence came back and said, and I quote, Australia did not attend a United States briefing on UAPs. Now, the reason why that's a concern, and this is a credit to, um, to ARO here, they're actually doing, they're fulfilling their legislative mandate. So if I show on screen, I'll just pull up uh, make sure I've got the right document here. There it is. So this document we know is the National Defense Authorization Act for fiscal year 2022. And uh, if we do a quick little uh, search in this document, oops, I can search it. I'm not sure if it is, but essentially, uh, I don't know if I can search in this document now. Maybe I can't. But we know in this uh, National Defence Authorization Act that one of the mandates that the UAP office, ARO, has is to coordinate with allies of the United States to better understand the nature and the extent of UAP. And so they've been doing exactly that. They've been fulfilling that legislative mandate. Uh, and I'll show you the supporting ev evidence of that is the Office of the Director of National Intelligence 2022 annual report on UAP, which came out in, uh, I believe it was January of this year. It was overdue, but it came out in January. And if I just come down to uh, the appropriate line of commentary, I believe it is... Where is it? Let me just find it. I don't seem to be able to do a, a search in here for some reason. That's okay. Uh, let me just find the um, the line of commentary. Uh, I think it's on this one. Here we go. Uh, so partnerships and collaboration, OD9 and ARA are committed to the responsible sharing of UAP findings with 
interagency partners, other stakeholders, congressional oversight, international partners, Australia being an international partner ally, and the public. Go on to page six. ODI and I and ARA have maintained have maintained communications with our allied partners re regarding UAP, keeping them informed of developments and US initiatives. Well, does that include Australia? Because Australia is saying that, no, it hasn't had any engagement from the US. It has no desire to collaborate. Uh, and it didn't attend a Five Eyes forum on UAP. And remember back to the congressional UAP hearing uh, in May of last year. Remember what Scott Bray said? Let me refresh your memory. Assemble subject matter experts from across the Department of Defense and the intelligence community and other U.S. government agencies and departments. We forge partnerships with the research, development, and acquisition communities, with industry partners, and with academic research labs. And we brought many allies and international partners into our discussions on UAP. Many, the word many allies and international partners. So fast forward to uh, only a few days ago where you have uh, RO Director Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick. He holds an off-camera media roundtable. And one of the questions that he has asked, and I'll see if I can, uh, it does, it is working, the search. Okay. I just couldn't see it. Uh, so question. Uh, this is Ethan Holmes with Sputnik News. Two questions for you. First of all, has ARA coordinated with at all with foreign governments, including potential adver adversaries, to try and broaden their data sets on UAP? Uh, the, the response from Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick. So on the first part, we have coordinated with some allies and partners. So there's a bit of a discrepancy here. We're getting Scott Bray maybe conflating uh, the engagement that then AIMSOG had had with allies using the word many. Now, many to me is more than some. So is that semantics? Again, we're getting into you know, some ambigu disambiguity here, uh, many versus some, and we now have Australia saying that it, do it did not uh, attend the Five Eyes Forum on UAP. So which allies, just which allies has ARO engaged to date? Well, we know Canada and New Zealand, but we don't know of anyone else. So I reached out to Susan Goff uh, only a few days ago to try and seek some further clarification. I haven't received a response at the airing of this, uh, this live stream, but essentially I shared the Canberra Times article and... I said, you know, following recent reports in Australian news media regarding the Five Eyes Forum on UAP led, uh, a Five Eyes Forum on UAP led by Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick back in May, uh, I thought I'd take this opportunity to reconnect and solicit clarification from IRA Director Dr. Sean, Sean Kirkpatrick. And I included a link. Uh, I agree with you, Colin. It is um, very much semantics. Uh, I, I would tend to um, agree with you on that front, which is very frustrating and doesn't really help, uh, you know, instill confidence in the public and, and bolster, you know, what they've said time and time again. They want to be able to share as much as they can with the American public and be transparent. So my question to Susan Goff was, and I hope to get a response at some point, on consideration of the above news, uh, of the above Australian news media report and in an effort to help set the record straight, because I'm confused, could I, conf could I kindly request a response to the following two questions? Were all Five Eyes member countries, US, Canada, UK, Australia, New Zealand, represented at the Five Eyes Forum on UAP, led by Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick in May 2023? If not, and that's taking uh, the Australian Department of Defence at its word, uh, that Australia did not attend a United States briefing on UAPs. If not, why did Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick publicly characterise the briefing meeting as a Five Eyes Forum, direct quote from his attendance at NASA's UAP IST public hearing, public meeting on 31 May 2023, when not all Five Eyes member countries were represented. A fair question. How can you call it a Five Eyes Forum on UAP if not all Five Eyes Forum mem member countries or Five Eyes Forum, uh, Five Eyes member countries uh, weren't represented? So is that a deliberate mischaracterization of that briefing? Um, or is it simply an oversight on Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick's part? 
um, or is it um, unintentional? I don't know, but I'd like to get some more um, more clarity uh, on on that. I think it's uh, it's important because you know Australia is it lockstep on every defense initiative with the United States, but you know closest of allies, it couldn't be further apart <laughs> uh, on the issue of UAP. So you know, fast forward to uh, a few days after that. Canberra, the Canberra Times article comes out and we get a post on X, formerly Twitter, from Deputy Prime Minister, Minister for Defence, Richard Miles, 1st of November. An enormous pleasure to catch up with my friend, US Secretary of Defence, Lloyd Austin in Washington. This is now the sixth, the sixth time that Richard Miles has had, had engagement with the Secretary of Defence, Lloyd Austin, uh, in the last 15 months. And out of those six engagements, uh, I've received back through Freedom of Information Act uh, agendas, talking points, and meeting schedules for the first four of those engagements. And UAP, as you would expect, was not tabled for discussion. So why, you know, you, you would think that the defence leader of Australia, uh, the individual in, you know, that under his leadership, you would want to at least think that he would have a, a desire to be briefed on what is keeping, you know, U US Congress up at night uh, and the Department of Defense up at night with respect to UAP, which they've suggested, said time and time again, represents there's a domain awareness gap by them not being able to detect UAP. And we know that they've set a domain awareness gap time, domain awareness gap time and time again, following the shoot down events in February uh, of this year. So I uh, quote tweeted Richard Miles. It's a bit hard to see, so I'll read it. And I called him out on that specifically. And I'd never ex expect a response, and he never has, probably because someone else manages his social media. As this marks your sixth engagement with SecDef Austin in the last 15 months, Richard Miles, have you been briefed by USD USDOD on the national security threats and safety of flight risk that unidentified anomalous phenomena pose? If not, why not? Australian taxpayers deserve an answer. And I think that's a fair question. Furthermore, under your leadership as Minister for Defence, AUDOD is treating the issue as a complete joke. Case in point, and I added the article. So I suspect the article would have been seen by a lot of folks in government because it is the leading newspaper in Australia's, uh, the, our, our nation's capital. Um, uh, and I've submitted a couple of FOIA requests following release publication of that article to see if I can uh, get a sense as to what conversations uh, have been had on UAP following the call out of Australian Defence's lack of interest uh, on the, the real clear and present national security threats and safety of flight risk that UAP pose. So um, I'll keep you posted on the response if I get one from Susan Goff, trying to seek clarification uh, on uh five eyes member countries attendance or and or non-attendance at that um at that briefing in may uh actually let me come back to where i was because i now want to switch gears and tell you um a little about another article that just popped up recently and that is uh, in the in the debrief, which broke obviously the David Grush uh, allegations, courtesy of Leslie Kane and Ralph Blumenthal. So if you haven't seen this article, uh, it's a really uh, I think it's a really well written article. There's some really valid points in there. It's the link is in the description in the show notes below. Let me pull it up for you because it's actually quite pertinent to uh, obviously what we're talking about in an Australian context today. So if I Pull this up for you. <laughs> you could replace the word United Kingdom with Australia. Why is the United Kingdom so far behind on UAP policy? Uh, and this was um, article was written by a gentleman by the name of John Priestland, who's the chair of uh, an organization called Unhidden. And what is, uh, I would encourage you to have a read of this article and, and Kudos, your know, hat tip to my good friend TP Loft 2008 for flagging this. Um, this is an interesting, uh, interesting quote 
Actually, let me just pull up uh, pull up the quote in question. Uh, I'm just going to find where it is again. See if I can find it. I won't read through the uh, the whole um, article. Um, um, let me just find where it was. Oh, for the life of me, I can't remember which one it was, but I'll read the point that I believe was... Ah, um... oh, here we go. There we go. So this, uh, you could apply this directly to Australia. Uh, yet at a time when the United States has set up the All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office, are to investigate UAP sightings, have held a hearing on UAPs in the House of Representatives, and have the Schumer Amendment on UAP transparency making its way. Let me get rid of this bloody thing here. Uh, making its way through Congress, are we really to believe that the UK government has no resources focusing on UAPs? You could actually ask the same question of Australia. You know, publicly they're telling us one thing, but behind closed doors, are they having some very different conversations? Because unfortunately, the intelligence community is FOIA exempt. So we're never going to be able to know what conversations are being had by uh, ASIO by the Defense Intelligence Organization, by the uh, National Geospatial um, Organization for Australia, uh, ASIS. You know, we, we're not going to know, uh, and more importantly, the Australian Signals Directorate is another one. We're not going to know if they've had any engagement on this topic to date. Uh, and that, you know, comes back to the question well, the Australian Department of Defense has made a broad brushstroke admission that Australia did not attend a United States briefing on UAP. Well, does that incorporate the intelligence community or are you only just speaking on behalf of defence? So uh, interesting article. Feel free to, to check it out. Have a read of it if you wish. Um, what also came out a couple of days ago, this was, um, what's today? It's the seventh today, only two days ago on the 5th of November. So ABC Radio National uh, they put out via a podcast uh, called Rear Vision, which is hosted by, presented by uh, a lady by the name of Taryn Priadko. Uh, it goes for about 30 minutes. The link is in the show notes. I'd encourage you to um, to check it out because it's it's a sign that the news media is starting to take a little bit more of a serious tone on this topic. You, know, you don't get any, uh, even though the X-Files theme is played <laughs> Uh, in this podcast, it's for context, so it's not to you know ridicule or apply the uh, the walls of stigma that we know Sunrise uh, do all the time on Brecky Central when they cover the UAP topic. But it actually is a really good 28 minute podcast because it it covers a nice chronological history of uh, you know the the name of the podcast. If I bring it up for you. It's uh, it, you know, it's actually for someone that's new to the topic, uh, it's it's a pretty good introduction, because if I um pull it up for you, this is the you know from from UFO to UAP, how the hunt for flying saucers made it to U.S. Congress. So it covers essentially, you know, the days of Kenneth Arnold through to Roswell, through to the Robertson panel, through you know Project Sign, Grudge, Blue Book. To where we are now with David Grush's uh, revelations and and claims that the U.S. has operated this clandestine crash retrieval and reverse engineering program, uh, it would have been great to see this podcast incorporate some information that's a bit closer to home on Australia's you know complete inaction on the topic. So I actually reached out to Taryn Priadko after I listened to this podcast and. I just flagged with her that, you know, thanks for putting out some great serious content that is free of stigma. Uh, if you're interested in covering you know, the, the puzzling position of the Australian Department of Defence and their complete lack of interest and action on the topic, uh, I'd be delighted to have a conversation with you. So um, who knows? I may not hear back, but it would be interesting to see if uh, we get some more coverage on UAP in Australian context, building off of what obviously the... Uh, the Canberra Times has already done. 
Uh, I know there's a few comments, so I'm going to come to those in just a moment. I just want to uh, hit up uh, another one. Let me just show you another screen here. So I had the good fortune of being uh, invited on the so on the 28th of October, uh, another radio program, 4EB, UFO Radio, Digital Radio. Um, they do, uh, you know, stories and, uh, re and reporting just on the UFO UAP topic in an Australian context. So Rowan Bo, she's doing a really good job, uh, you know, with these episodes. They've only recently launched. Uh, they had in their first episode was the 7th of October. They've now done, what's that, five episodes already. They had um, on the 28th of October, they had uh, Ben Hurl, uh, an Australian researcher, talk at length on some of the work that he's been doing. Uh, I was fortunate enough to get around about, well, I'd say, five five to ten minutes of, uh, of commentary at the back end of that episode, just providing uh, some context and frame of reference for you know, UAP in, in Australian setting. Uh, so if there are folks that, again, are, are new to the topic and they're listening to this radio station, uh, just to kind of give them a sense as to where Australia stands on the subject. So again, this this is all kind of supporting you know, evidence to a degree that we're starting to see a little bit of a shift, I believe, in the Australian news media. I know that there's going to be some more stories coming out on uh, UAP in, in an Australian context. So hopefully we start to get this sh slow shift away from the bloody X-Files theme being you know, played during every segment on, uh, on breakfast shows uh, and so on. Uh, before we kind of wrap out the, the rundown piece, I did want to, I did want to uh, call out uh, a really good episode on Somewhere in the Skies uh, from the last week. So, and uh, thanks to my good friend Ryan Sprague for allowing me to, to showcase a couple of clips from that show. So Ryan had uh, Diana Walsh Pasolka on his uh, his show. Uh, she was obviously talking about the release of her new book, Encounters, but also you know uh, talking about the work that she's been doing. Obviously, she's now a, a, a member of the board of the Soul Foundation. She talked about uh, her involvement in the Netflix series Encounters, which is uh, which I thought was done really, really well. So if you haven't seen it, uh, I'd certainly recommend you you check it out. And um, when I was watching this episode, this interview, uh, you know, with uh, Ryan Sprague and Diana Wash Pasolka, I found it interesting that Westall came up in discussion. So let me show you a brief clip from this interview with uh, Diana Wash Pasolka on Somewhere in the Skies, and we'll talk about it uh, on the other side. Were there any cases that you would wish they covered that they didn't? Um, aerial school obviously is a big. And I should say for, for reference, so the, the context here is Ryan is asking Dinah Walsh Pasolka about, because she was uh, uh, involved in the Encounters episode, um, were there any cases that you would have liked to have seen covered in Encounters or did you recommend any cases? So so that's the, the context. I got to ask, were there any cases that you would wish they covered that they didn't. Um, aerial school obviously is a big one right now. Um, and it was, it was surprising to see them tackle the, you know, the UFOs that have been seen in Japan, but any that really you'd hope that they had done in the series that they hadn't. Oh, so I did pr propose the Westall, uh, Australian school. Oh yeah. Uh, it happened in the 1960s and it's as compelling as the Rua school. And in my opinion, it, but you know, it, Australia is halfway around the world. <laughs> so, and of course my focus has been there uh, looking at, at, you know, what's happened, you know, Australia is a fascinating place, a lot of activity there. And that one was really fascinating because the people are now, I think in their sixties, um, and they are adamant that it happened and they have the same story. Uh, there, there were teachers involved who are still alive and, and were, are talking about it and they go really in depth into the various aspects of it. So, um, you know, they couldn't cover everything, right. 
but um, but yeah, so I suggested that they do that one and um, a couple others I suggested. So there you have it. So if Encounters comes back for a second season, that would be pretty cool if uh, if the Westall incident was included uh, as part of one of those episodes because uh, it was great to hear that Diana Walsh Pasolka had suggested that. And, and she's 100% right. It is one of the most enduring... Uh, you know, unsolved cold cases, uh, UAP cases to date, you know, for those that don't have a, a frame of reference for the Westall incident, uh, I won't go into detail now, but I would encourage you to have a look at the uh, video documentary that I did a couple months back called The Westall Wit Witnesses. I had an opportunity to meet a small number of primary witnesses, get them on camera, uh, interview them in long form format, and really just get them recounting and sharing their recollections from that day, the 6th of April, 1966. So, yeah, really, really uh, interesting to hear that Diana Walsh Pasolka had made a recommendation there on uh, on Westall because it is uh, such an intriguing case. And I know Jimmy is a uh, is a fan of, uh, of of Westall and the work that I've been able to uh, to to research on it to date. So, it was interesting. So that's a good segue into um, another talking point that came up in discussion with Diana Walsh Pasolka on that episode of Somewhere in the Skies with Ryan Sprague is um, Ryan often solicits uh, you know questions from his audience, his Patreon members, those on Twitter, and he was very kind enough to ask one of the questions that I wanted to pose to uh, Diana Walsh Pasolka. So let me play that for you now and uh, we can uh, we can talk about it on the other side to this one here uh grant lavac on twitter asks could you kindly comment on the soul foundation's plans to engage with national governments on the uap issue now i know for a fact grant lives in australia so is soul going to be an international organization yes um yeah. definitely and so i do know that they are um in conversation already with different governments because different governments have different policies with respect to say crash retrieval or or the phenomena and they're not necessarily our policy uh but seoul is doing this completely above board transparently and um with the um knowledge of you know uh, and oversight of our own government. So it's not going to overstep, you know, if our government is saying, no, you know, you can't work with Canada on this or something like that. Uh, Gary is like, you know, he's, he's been a scientist at Stanford and we have to go through what's called uh, internal review boards in order to do like interviews of people and things like that. So we already have this established that we need to go through the hoops in order to do things on kind of like the up and up, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, so they're going, so they are, they're gonna be reaching out to various governments they already have. And they're going to be trying to make an international effort here as well as an effort that's more diverse. Um, so, part of what they're hoping to do is to bring in you know uh, the ufo field has pretty much been non-diverse right we can i think agree on that <laughs> it's this usually this guy right here yeah i know what you mean <laughs> but so you know but there are a lot of people that um are diverse who have very important information and uh and also um contributions you know they have skills and contributions so so i know that they're that this is also a priority and i think it's important awesome that's good to hear i know grant is all for international uh relations on this topic i mean how else do you get to the answers to a global phenomenon oh. without involving yeah. other yeah. other countries it, it mystifies me a lot of the time so there you go. I mean, and again, thanks to Ryan Sprague for uh, for, for asking that question. Uh, interesting. So that the Seoul Foundation has already had some engagement with some uh, nations' governments. Which na which governments have they uh, started engaging with? I suspect Australia is probably on the bottom of their list uh, based on their uh, their their lack of desire to collaborate on the topic. But nonetheless, it's it's encouraging to see that there is now. Um, an organization, uh, a foundation, a nonprofit organization that has part of its remit, its mission to engage, 
you know, other governments, uh, other, you know, outside of just the United States to uh, help facilitate with policy recommendations uh, and, uh, and, and get them taking the topic seriously. So um, interesting, I think, a bit of a, a watch this space with, uh, with the Seoul Foundation. And it will also be interesting to see what happens with the Seoul Foundation uh, because later this month, I know that they have their inaugural uh, conference scheduled. So this is the Seoul Foundation's website. So the Gary Nolan, the Nolan Laboratory Department of Pathology and the Stanford School of Medicine present the Seoul Foundation Initiative for UAP Research and Policy. So they have a symposium taking place uh, in, uh, what's that, about 10 days' time, the 17th and the 18th over two days. Um, I know that um, Kelly Chase uh, is um, has got a ticket to that event. Uh, if you uh, haven't followed her work on, uh, on YouTube and Twitter, she does a lot of great stuff on her podcast, um, The UFO Rabbit Hole, I believe it is. Uh, so it would be interesting to, to hear how that uh, that inaugural conference goes and you know it is apparently being uh it will be recorded and i think it's going to be um uh played for um for public consumption so i mean you can see there that they've got some pretty pretty big names that they've slated for presentation rv loeb charles mccullough uh, uh, david grush's lawyer christopher mellon diana walsh pasolka jacques valet uh, obviously Gary Nolan and others as well. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing what comes out of that um, inaugural conference. And uh, I'm sure there'll be plenty of information posted online uh, as a bit of a breakdown of that event. So that's uh, somewhere in the skies. That's pretty much the, the, the last thing I wanted to uh, show uh, with respect to the rundown. Again, just giving you an update of what's been going on at home and uh, with, with respect to a uh, UAP in Australian context is this piece by 60 Minutes in the United States. So I, I'm not sure if many of you saw this, but I was quite uh, intrigued to learn that the 60 Minutes program in the United States had actually done a story on the Five Eyes. So members of the Five Eyes Intelligence Alliance actually came out, they revealed themselves, and they talked on camera with 60 Minutes essentially about uh, China's corporate, estina, uh, corporate espionage uh, that targets the U.S.'s trade secrets. So you can watch, the. Uh, there's a link to uh, the 60 Minutes episode in the show notes if you want to watch it, uh, feel free. I found it interesting, though, that, you know, these guys that represented each of the member countries of the five eyes were prepared to go on camera with 60 minutes but they'll stay completely silent on uap N namely the the fire the five eyes forum on uap we know you know canada hasn't said much about their attendance and participation uh new zealand has has said uh very very little obviously the UK has said nothing, and Australia's just saying mm, we didn't attend. So, you know, quite a, a puzzling contrast and, you know, two opposite ends of the spectrum. They'll happily talk about and come forward and talk about China, but they won't talk about UAP. Interesting. Interesting. Uh, so let's move away from the, the rundown. I'm a bit parched, actually, somewhat. Just have a sip of the old... Ah, Moon River Coffee. Uh, and by the way, if you um, notice, I have a nice new coffee mug and uh, some apparel to go with it. So if you're uh, if you're keen to check out some of the apparel that's in the uh, the Unexplained Rundown merch store, feel free. Bit of fun. Uh, I don't get uh, you know anything of financial significance out of merchandise. It's one or two dollars basically for every item sold, but bit of fun and uh, it obviously can uh, help support the channel a little bit as you go. So if you're keen to explore the merch store, let me give you a bit of a preview. The Unexplained Rundown is pleased to partner with tpublic.com and bring you some fun and fantastical apparel and accessories that are truly out of this world. 
If you're keen to support the show and see it grow, be sure to check out some of the cool designs in the merch store and grab yourself a bargain. Use the link in the description below. So a few fun designs. Uh, check it out. Again, link is in the description below. Uh, yeah, a couple of uh, fun fun designs out there that you can explore. I know Jimmy has uh, graciously picked up a few items, so yeah, check it out if you're interested. So let's segue. Let's talk about some uh, recent events that have been happening uh, on UAP in uh, in an Australian context. So last month, uh, when I had my last live stream, actually one month ago to the day, uh, I talked about Westall the musical which was being um, had its world premiere on the 25th and the 26th. It was a primary school production, so it wasn't, you know, Broadway or anything like that, but really great to see that, you know, there are young people getting involved, engaged on the topic, doing a, uh, a musical production uh, written, produced by Drew Lane. I know he worked tirelessly on uh, on on putting this together and it was very, very well received. Uh, I know Shane Ryan attended the event, Shane Ryan being the, I guess you'd call him the authority or lead investigator um, on the Westall incident. I mean, there are many others as well, Bill Chalker, Keith Basterfield and Ross Coulthard as well, but he's done a lot of the groundwork and um, yeah, it was very well, very well received. I unfortunately wasn't able to attend because I was, uh, I was traveling up to Sydney for Ross Coulthard's Q&A event, which we'll talk about in a second. But very, very interesting to see that Westall 66, the musical, reached the Australian Victorian Parliament. So let me show you a clip that highlights the very first time that Westall has been discussed, uh, no matter how informally as it is in this clip, uh, the first time that Westall has been talked about in uh, Victorian Parliament, yet alone Australian Parliament. It's my absolute pleasure to visit my old school St Peter's last week to see Westall 66, the musical, written by performing arts teacher Drew Lane. The production was about the famous UFO sighting at Westall in the member for Clorinda's electorate in 1966. The students were absolutely stunning in the production. Congratulations Allegra, Ahern McIntyre, Alice Bottomley, Oscar De Silva, Henry McCracken, Sid Noble, Ashlyn Scahill, Isabel Sutty, Tyler Twitchett, Tess Buddick, Antonia Bondanza, Ciara McCarthy, Maddie McDowell, Faith Andronopoulos, Macy Carter, Katia Greco, Beth Keyburn, Ella Kerger, Holly Pelk, Jewel Roby, Amelia Vigona, Lulu Bloomfield, Scarlett Bloomfield, Caitlin Chung, Yan Cow, Xander Engelbrecht, Chloe McDowell, Sophia Pinto, Lily Swart, Ariana Vallis, Eloise Wood Bradley, Noah Bui, Eleanor Catania, Paige Deval, Liberty Paul McKeon, Hannah Matthews, Paige Renault, Joe Wilson, Bianca Archer, Camille Bottomley, Isabel Benici, Alexia Helongwain, Stella Kalinowski, Jasmine Lee, Ella Quinn, Olivia Trojak, Nyamuka, Stephanie Vlasopoulos. Congratulations again, everyone. It was a wonderful production. Um, I absolutely loved it. I am very proud of my uh, old school St Peter's, which continues to do better every year when it comes to its uh, performing arts program. They did a fantastic job. Agreed. Very, very cool. And and hopefully the success, following the success of Westall 66, the musical, uh, Drew Lane uh, does some uh, additional shows or takes it on tour. So I think it's pretty, pretty cool to keep the um, the story of the Westall incident alive and and introduce it to a, a you know the, the younger generation of today. So um, I don't know if there was a, a recording of that event, but again. Um, I suspect, you know, following the success that there may be opportunities for some uh, some further um, shows on, on tour. So let's segue and talk about now the, the big one. Uh, so Ross Coulthard, for those of you that don't know, um, author of The Essential Reading in Plain Sight, which has recently been revised and updated. So in uh, August of this year, uh, he did a in-person presentation and Q&A session at the State Library of Victoria, which I had the good fortune, and I know some in the uh, in the chat had the good fortune of attending as well. Um, he did that very same presentation and Q&A session recently in Sydney. So on Saturday, the 28th of October, 
Uh, I have family in Sydney, so I headed up there a couple of days early. And uh, Ross was uh, did again a presentation and QA and event uh, in Sydney at the State Library of New South Wales. And it was actually, I was keen to get up there, not just to see Ross, uh, who I, I really uh, believe has done a wonderful job to help elevate the conversation on the UAP UFO topic and obviously the, the, the research that he continues to do, obviously bringing David Grush to the world with his uh, breaking News Nation interview and so on. But it was also an opportunity to meet some folks that I developed friendships with, uh, that I've engaged with on social media, uh, there were a couple of journalists at that event, one that I uh, was was keen to meet with, and I, I did briefly. So um, it was a really, really good event. Now, the organizers, Close Encounters Australia, filmed the event like they did the the Melbourne event. And uh, my understanding is they will be premier, premiering the event on their YouTube channel uh, in the not-too-distant future. So um, Close Encounters Australia, they YouTube link is in the show notes below. So if you want to have a look at that event, if you haven't seen the Melbourne event, uh, it's on their channel. Feel free to, to check it out. But again, I had the, the good fortune uh, of attending that event. And um, it, was, <laughs> it was quite a funny event uh, in, this, in the respect that the moment you walked in to the State Library of New South Wales for the event, you were greeted uh, by this, this gentleman. Uh, Ian of skeptics.com.au <laughs> was the, a, a sole protester uh, on the day. He actually had his own made-up little banner. It's a bit hard to read, so I'll read it for you. Uh, Ross Coulthard, you speak of humans from the future, interdimensional beings, life after, life after death, nothing but conjecture, hearsay, fantasy, fake news. Scientists need real evidence. Australian skeptics offer you our $100,000 challenge to back up your claims. Uh, do you want our Bent Spoon Award instead? So th that's what people encountered as they were uh, walking into the State Library of New South Wales. Now, unbeknownst to Ian, there are actually a number of, uh, a decent number of scientists that were in attendance on the day. Roger Stankovic is, is one. Uh, MUFON director for, for Australia and New Zealand, and there were several others. So, uh, you know, Ian was, I wouldn't say challenged, but he was he well, challenged with some respectful conversation as people uh, entered. And, uh, you know, what you would not expect from the debunking community, uh, but, you know, Ross graciously invited this gentleman, Ian, to come in during Q&A and ask a question that was important to him. So, you know, credit, kudos and respect to Ross for uh, welcoming Ian into the event to engage in respectful conversation. And that's exactly what happened. So uh, it was a, a really nice venue. It was a sold out crowd. You know, this is just giving you a sense as to the, the layout uh, of, the, uh, of the venue itself. Uh, you can see it was a, a packed house. There's probably about 170 folks that were in attendance. Uh, and just a very, very uh, interesting conversation, quite different to the Melbourne event. And for those of you that are interested to watch the premiere of this event when it goes uh, live on Close Encounters Australia's channel, uh, you'll you'll notice that it is quite a different event to that of Melbourne, which is really cool. You know, Ross actually dived into you know, building on the placard that the Ian from skeptics.com.au uh, had, you know, he talked about science and he talked about, uh, well, you know, the scientific community is all about, uh, uh, you know, data, uh, repeatability, but where the scientific community is uh, probably, uh, you know, lacking or is is quick to disregard is, um, you know, uh, witness testimony. You know, we, we rely on witness testimony, testimony in the court of law to convict or acquit, acquit uh, folks, uh, your know, witness testimony should not be so quickly dismissed by the scientific and the academic community. You can't rely on witness testimony alone, but it shouldn't be disregarded. It shouldn't be dismissed altogether. So Ross was talking about you know, science uh, versus uh, you know, and the importance of uh, recognizing witness testimony. Uh, and he, he talked about a number of things uh, on the day um, and I won't go into it because I obviously don't want to, you know, 
spoil the content that uh, Close Encounters Australia have recorded from that event, so you can watch it in due course. Uh, but Ross did welcome Ian the Skeptic into the Q&A section uh, to ask a question. And you know, Ross, I think, answered very well, with a little bit of humour in there as well, saying that Ross isn't making these claims. As an investigative journalist, as a reporter, he's sharing, he's he's reporting on the information that comes to him, right? So he is not making these claims himself. He is doing what any reporter or journalist would do and reporting the claims that have been made to him. He's not saying it's true. It's not true. He's just putting the information out there so people can make their own informed judgment, uh, you know, and and do with what the information they will. He did mention he had some level of regret of uh, of coming forward with the uh, the revelation that he had been informed of a large uh, UAP that had to have a a building uh, placed over it to keep it uh, to keep it out of plain sight, uh, and he only indicated that he had uh, some you know some wish that he didn't come forward because he had no uh, and he he didn't anticipate the the pushback and the you know the the the, uh, the furor that would come as a result of him you know announcing that on on project unity with with jay so and you'll see that obviously when you watch the recording but all in all uh, a really informative event again great for those that are perhaps new to the topic uh, not as well versed as maybe us that have an opportunity. To, we heavily invest in it. We research it. We 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 often know ahead of what is uh, released in the press. Uh, you know what 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 is happening and what's been talked about. So, but the Q and A section was uh, was very interesting, and I think the way that Ross responded to Ian the skeptic's question was done in a very respectful way, um, and uh, and and kind of again he was positioning that. I'm a reporter. I'm a journalist. I'm just reporting on the claims that have been shared with me. I'm not uh, advocating for their uh, veracity or their truth, uh, or, or, or you know, if they're false. He's just he's just retelling what was shared with him, without obviously jeopardising the safety, security, well-being of a source, or uh, you know, exposing potential national security uh, information. Uh, let me just show you also one or two other snaps from the from the event. And actually, I'll say, interestingly enough, what I found to be really um, humorous and also, uh, you know, kind of uh, poetic, I guess, is that the Ian, the gentleman that was out the front with that placard, the protester, you know, outside of the uh, the. The, the conference room, there was a very, very long line of people that wanted to, uh, you know, say good day to Ross, you know, thank him for elevating the conversation on the UAP topic, uh, get their book signed, ask him a question. Uh, but the individual that was the last to leave that event was Ian the Skeptic. And he picked up a copy of Ross's book. He had a conversation with Ross. And I think from those that had spoken with Ian, I didn't speak with him personally, but those that did told me that, uh, you know, I don't think Ian was anticipating people to be as well-versed on the topic and educated on the topic as they were. Uh, he came in with the thought that, oh, everyone's gullible. They're just believing what what Ross is putting out there is making all these claims and people are just lapping it up and buying it, where in actual fact it was the complete opposite. Uh, people in the room were just uh, willing to listen, have a sceptical mind and listen to what Ross had to, said, uh, Ross had to say, keep an open mind on what was being said uh, and reach their own conclusions as to you know, the, the, the claims that have been made to, to Ross. So yeah, really interesting. And again, credit to to Ross and others that were um, that respectfully engaged Ian the spec the, the skeptic. I think he left uh, the State Library of New South Wales probably in a slightly different frame of mind than uh, from when he arrived. So um, yeah, 
it was uh, it was a, a nice little 180 at the end of the day. And, and obviously, I was uh, very grateful for the opportunity to to meet uh, a lot of some of the great researchers that were in attendance. Obviously, from left to right, Roger Stankovic on the the far left, uh, Bill Chalker, veteran UAP researcher, uh, to the to the right of him, James Rigney, who we know was instrumental in uh, getting the Wilson Davis memo docs out there. To his right, you have Irene Previn, who's with Close Encounters uh, Australia, did a wonderful job to organize the event. Uh, you have a, a, a couple other folks there as well. Uh, to the right of Irene is another researcher in her, I believe, her 90s, who's working on another book that she's uh, on, on the, uh, I'm not too sure what the topic was. It could have been the UAP topic. And obviously you had Ross and, and members of the Close Encounters Australia team. So really, really cool event. Uh, I was... Again, grateful for the opportunity to be invited to uh, dine with these folks. And I was, uh, I sat next to Bill Chalker the whole night. So I actually uh, was probably uh, in Bill's ear far too much of the evening, uh, fascinated with the research that Bill has done over the years. Just a true uh, veteran when it comes to, um, you know, researching uh, the UAP topic, UFO topic uh, in an Australian context. Obviously, I had questions for the others that were there as well. But Really, really fun evening and great to just uh, pick the brains of these folks over the course of a couple of hours. So it was a lot of fun. So let's uh, move away from the... Uh, actually, before I jump into FOIA updates, let me uh, talk briefly, because we're still on recent events. Uh, I just want to talk briefly about... And I will come to the chat because I know people have... Uh, taken the effort to, to opine and put some comments in there. Let me just talk briefly about another event that happened last month. And that was, uh, if I can find the document, here it is. So on the 25th of October, Wednesday, 25th of October, we had the Senate estimates hearing in uh, in Parliament House. Now, unfortunately, on that day, the 25th, uh, defense, the defense portfolio uh, was scheduled to uh, have its hearing and there was, you know, all basically there was represented across the, in the entire Australian Department of Defense and Australian Defense Force. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Senator Wish Wilson was not able to attend that event due to competing priorities. However, um, I spoke with Senator Wish Wilson's office just last Friday, and uh, received confirmation that the senator has submitted uh, more than half a dozen questions on notice. So the submission deadline for questions on notice, written questions basically that uh, those that the questions are addressed to have an obligation to respond. So he submitted uh, more than a half a dozen questions to the Australian Department of Defence uh, on UAP in Australian context uh, and I won't go into more detail than that because I don't want to give anything away to those in defense that may be listening and anticipate what those questions are. Uh, so, yeah, expect to see some updates in the coming months. We'll get some responses from the Australian Department of Defense to the questions that Senator Wish Wilson had. Uh, so let's use that as an opportunity now to uh, segue into FOIA updates. Before I do, I just want to give folks uh, a chance to have their comments uh, heard. So let me just go through a couple of the comments that have come through. Um, let's go back. I know that UAP Altaero put in some good comments there. So so let's start. Uh, let's start here. And we'll talk about R as we go through. Uh, 12 CM32, need to query the RO and others about whether they have been in contact with Australia recently, maybe catch RAF in a lie. Yeah, you, you, it's it's a good question because there, I believe there's just a lot of, uh, it's still very ambiguous as to was Australia represented at the Five Eyes Forum? Wasn't it? If it wasn't, why did Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick characterise it as a Five Eyes meeting if not all Five Eyes members were in attendance? Uh, if the goal is to be as transparent with the American public and the rest of the world, uh, you're not doing the greatest of jobs 
and uh, uh, you know by mischaracterizing the event if in fact Australia did not attend and we'll get into Aro uh, a little later on because to Mark's point Mark McHigg Mark McHiggins uh, who trusts Aro uh, UAP Alate Aro Colin yes I agree there is this some semantics being played uh, Ross McLeod more sophistry and semantics from the gatekeepers I would tend to agree with you there. Mark McHiggins, Aro is another blue book, Mark too. Yeah, it's unfortunate that, you know, with the latest uh, annual report on UAP for fiscal year 23 that ODNI put out that was obviously compiled by Aro, that it, if you've read, and I would encourage encourage you to do this if you're interested. So John Greenwald Jr., who we know has done, uh, you know, some incredible foyer work for several decades he authored a really good book. It's also available as an audio book called Inside the Black Vault, where if you just listen and, and read what's included in his research, he talks about a lot of the FOIA work that he's done over the years, documents he's secured uh, you know, from Project Blue Book days. What we're really hearing now is that your know, RO, it feels like they're just wanting to explain away UAP as something that's completely prosaic. Uh, but we're not interested in what they can explain or what they can you know, reconcile or resolve. As Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick said uh, at his hearing, the hearing he attended in April, chaired by Senator Kirsten Gillibrand, he wants UAP reports to be someone else's problem and an SCP. So we're not really interested in those cases that get reconciled. We're interested in the 1% to 2% that are truly anomalous that, anomalous that cannot be identified. Because Project Blue Book wrapped up, closed shop, closed up shop with around about, was it one, two, three percent of cases that it was not able to resolve, about 750 cases. So rather than just try and explain away, you know, UAP in the most recent annual report for fiscal year 23, why aren't you alluding a little bit more to the one to two percent that are still unknowns that you're you know uh, that you're trying to resolve and reconcile we want to know a little bit more about those ones not you know just completely prosaic stuff well give us a sense as to what you're working on that is the one two percent that you're struggling to identify colin agrees ro equals blue book it certainly looks that way uh, at face value kirkpatrick is rumored to be leaving ro before the end of the year yes and we will talk about that uh, in just a moment. After Kirkpatrick's lies about Grush, doubt he will see the year out. I would say there is possibly, potentially some truth to that. Weird how we, Ross, weird how we keep parroting each other <laughs> UAP out there. Uh, synchronicity, you guys are on the same same playing field altogether. Uh, Mark's comments, when Sean Kirkpatrick said at the first meeting right off the bat that it was not ET, that in itself said enough. You know, and it's and it's funny that you say that because um, when for those of you that have seen uh, Senator Peter Wish Wilson question the Chief of Air Force in Senate estimates in November of last year, um, Senator Wish Wilson asked Chief of Air Force Air Marshal Robert Chipman if he had read uh, the um, the report that had come out oh sorry had had um was familiar with the um the report that the us had put out uh and he the first response i can't remember the exact quote verbatim but the response that the uh the air marshal gave was yes i'm aware of the report and i'm also aware of the fact that um od and i did not find any evidence to suggest that uh, it was extra, extraterrestrial in nature. Well, ODNI in, in none of their reports have ever alluded to extraterrestrial whatsoever. In their preliminary assessment on UAP that came out on 25th of June of 2021, they just used the term catch all other bin. They've never used the word extraterrestrial. And so the fact that the Chief of Air Force Air Marshal Robert Chipman was so quick to jump on the fact that, oh, no, they didn't say it was ET. Well, we, they never said it was ET in the first place. So the fact that you'll go down that, again, just an effort to kind of, uh, no, it's all prosaic stuff. You know, people will lose interest because it's clearly just nuts and bolts in the sky that's either our tech, foreign adversary, or just clutter uh, or misidentification. 
UOP Aotearoa, Sean Kirkpatrick is now, Sean M. Kirkpatrick is now registered as staff with the Department of Defence Oak Ridge National Laboratory run by UT and Battelle for energy. And those that are well versed on the topic will know that it's long rumoured that Battelle was the recipient of debris from the Roswell, uh, Roswell crash, whatever it was, uh, and has been there a, a long time defence contractor. They do a lot of work on materials, uh, metal, metallurgy, the hard word to pronounce. So the yeah, you know, it certainly raises some suspicions and eyebrows of uh, a perceived conflict of interest that Sean, Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick, may have if he is now. Uh, potentially going to be associated with, maybe employed by in the not too distant future, uh, uh, Oak Ridge National Labs that is run by Battelle, which is long rumored to be one of the uh, entities that is being uh, investigated as uh, part of this legacy program, potential uh, reverse engineering uh, program that we've heard time and time again from David Grush and others. What is also interesting, and you make a really good point there, Colin. Colin, uh, you know Ronald Moultrie, formerly Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick's boss. Kirkpatrick's boss now is the Deputy Secretary for Defence, Kathleen Hicks. Moultrie is on the board uh, of ORNL, um, or is that formally on the board? I'm not sure if he's still an active board member. Maybe he is. This stinks a lot, but good to have him gone, but not to the DOE protection. I agree. I, I I think a lot of people, um, <clears throat> and rightly so, Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick should be questioned and challenged on a perceived conflict of interest uh, and questioned for his performance thus far. Uh, but I also think Ronald, Mul Ronald Moultrie has a lot to answer for as well. The fact that he's the one that signs the checks or signed the checks for ARO and you know, in April of this year, Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick testified to uh, Kirsten Gillibrand that he had a strategic plan for ARA that was ready to go. He'd got some initiatives that were ready to go, and they were still sitting with Ronald Moultrie for sign-off. I mean, how bloody long does it take you to get a basic website up that, you know, in all honesty, the ARA website looks like it could have been whipped up, uh, you know, on GoDaddy within about 10, 15 minutes. And the fact you've still got no social media presence whatsoever, whatsoever from ARA. Still just the one post on the X feed from July of last year. Ridiculous. Let's, uh, we'll cover off on some of the other comments that have come through uh, towards the back end of the session because I'm mindful of everyone's time. But I just want to uh, give you a bit of an update on some of the uh, the FOIA work that um, I've, been, I've been doing. Uh, so let me uh, jump in here. So um, not so long ago, I had uh, a contact from New Zealand reach out to me with some correspondence that they'd received uh, from the Minister for Defence in New Zealand. And let me just find uh, the right document here. Here it is. So this was document, uh, your correspondence from the New Zealand Defence Force Minister Defence that was shared with me. Uh, this individual had made an um, OIA submission, which is comparable with Freedom of Information Act, uh, asking some questions about uh, basically New Zealand's uh, involvement on UAP. And essentially the response that came back from uh, the individual authorised to respond, AJ Woods, who's the Air Commodore, Chief of Staff, Headquarters for New Zealand Defence Force. He kind of backed up uh, Defence Scoop's reporting, Brandy Vincent's reporting that you know, a New Zealand Defence Force representative attended the Five Eyes Forum on UAP. So we have the statement, while a New Zealand Defence Force representative based in Washington, D.C., and that's uh, important, based in Washington, D.C., attended a briefing by Dr. Kirkpatrick on behalf of New Zealand. Uh, and then it goes on, Defence Force does not hold information concerning any current, considered or planned interactions with Dr. Kirkpatrick or the United States, De United States Department of Defence or the main Anomaly Resolution Office, which is interesting. You know, you would think that 
a Five Eyes forum on UAP, if 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 RO's legislative mandate is that it has to coordinate with allies um, to better understand the the extent and nature of UAP, and they have to provide um, annual updates to Congress on RO's efforts to engage allies, it's interesting that there is appears to be no future planned interaction between a Five Eyes member country, New Zealand, and ARA. So maybe the Five Eyes Forum is just done on an annual cadence and they won't have any interaction with ARA till next year. Who knows? But I thought that was an interesting point. Anyway, so why this is important. So the fact that you have a New Zealand Defence Force representative that's based in Washington, D.C., and that to me suggests that it is more than likely the... um, the equivalent of the defense air attache or the defense attache or air attache to the United States in Washington, D.C. So uh, Australia also has a defense attache and an uh, air and space attache to the United States in Washington, D.C. So the fact that you had a New Zealand Defense Force representative that's quite possibly with the defense attache uh, or the, uh, you know, the New Zealand defense attache in Washington, D.C., that prompted me to uh, submit a Freedom of Information Act request to the Australian Department of Defence, trying to see if I could find anything that would pertain to the uh, Australian air and space uh, attache to the United States in Washington, DC. So I submitted a Freedom of Information Act request um, asking for you know, copies of emails, including supporting file attachments sent from to cross copied to personnel. So that's a catch all personnel assigned to the Air and Space Attache Washington, D.C. for the period 1 April of this year to 30th of June. So capturing the Five Eyes forum in that date range that contain any of the following keywords FVEYS, which is the acronym for Five Eyes, so Five Eyes Meeting. I specifically used FVEYS Meeting because that was the exact subject heading that was included in email correspondence between presumably Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick and uh, NASA's Dan Evans and the now uh, NASA's UAP Director of Research, Mark McInerney. Uh, That was the specific subject heading, so that's why I included it in the request, along with some other keywords that might catch any correspondence. And um, not really to any surprise, no documents were identified. So again, that's another kind of breadcrumb that may back up the admission by the Australian Department of Defence that Australia did not attend a United States briefing on UAPs. Again, don't know about the intelligence communities, but it's looking more and more likely that uh, there was no defence representation from Australia, which again is odd. New Zealand had defence representation, as did Canada. Why did Australia not have any defence representation? Particularly if it's, you know, uh, I mean, the the Royal Australian Air Force has such a long history investigating UAP in Australia. Wouldn't they be the candidate of choice to be at a Five Eyes Forum on UAP to learn, you know, what the US is doing? Uh, Is it worthy of Australia's time, energy and effort to, you know, revisit and review its position on UAP? I think it is. And I don't know why Australia thinks it's not. So that's kind of giving you a bit of a um, a FOI update. No cigar there, I'm afraid, but I do have a number of other uh, pending FOI requests that uh, hopefully will uh, you know, reveal some more breadcrumbs uh, over time. So let's um let's as we kind of come to the back end, and then I want to again give everyone a chance to have their comments uh, seen. What's ahead? So um, what's going to be very interesting uh, in the next, you know, fortnight is uh, this event, the Unidentified Anomalous Phenomena, the Search for Clarity, a in-person and virtual event being hosted by the Hayden Center. Uh, now, I've put the link in the description below. It's free to register for the event. I've registered uh, and I reached out to the event organizers and they have confirmed that there will be Q&A at that point in time. There was still, I guess, Q&A schedule. Now, with everything that's happened with 
Aro and Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick and the back and forth he said, he said with David Grush. It'll be interesting to see if they still plan to do a Q&A because I imagine there's going to be some pretty uh, heated, potentially heated questions that are going to be asked of uh, Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick. So uh, if you're interested to register for the event, I've included the link in the description below. Let me just pull up the uh, the page as well so you can see. Uh, here it is. So this is the, let's wait for this to fresh. So it's the um, Hayden V, uh, Michael V Hayden Center for Intelligence Policy and International Security, uh, scheduled for the 15th, uh, so just over a week's time, 15th of this month. So there'll be the 16th for Australia. Um, and I'll see if there's um, any information that we can uh, we can just read on what they plan to cover off on. Uh, no, it doesn't look like there is uh, much information other than what they've put in the um, in the banner graphic there. So the question that I have, and I'm going to be asking virtually, and hopefully my question is uh, is considered, is um, Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick. Um, at the at the NASA public meeting with the UAP independent study team on the 31st of May, you announced the inaugural Five Eyes Forum on UAP, yet, uh, yet the Australian Department of Defence has made an, a public admission that Australia did not attend a United States briefing on UAPs. Can you please set the record straight and answer the following question with a yes or no? Was Australia represented at the Five Eyes Forum on UAP? If not, why did you characterise the Five Eyes Forum on UAP when not all Five Eyes member countries were represented? Uh, that is the question that I want a direct answer to from Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick because I'm getting nothing but, um, you know, fluff, uh, to be blatantly honest, from Susan Goff. Goff, she's not really uh, being... Uh, forthcoming with uh, her answers to any of the questions that I've got. Uh, and often that is the case with Australian Department of Defence as well. They will just sometimes give you a non-answer or they will not answer your question whatsoever and just reiterate what the current policy of the Australian Department of Defence is, which is it has no policy for the recording and reporting of UAP. So interesting. It'll be uh, interesting to learn what happens at that event on the, uh, on the 16th. Uh, the last thing I'll just leave you with is obviously uh, to give you an update closer to home. I'm still waiting on a response from the Minister for Defence, Richard Miles, on the petition that I submitted to the Australian House of Representatives requesting a formal review of UAP uh, and asking uh, for the establishment of an investigatory body uh, to be considered to assess the potential national security threats and safety of flight risk that UAP pose uh, so that we can address any domain awareness gap in Australia. That is now, that response is now overdue. Uh, response was is required within 90 days of me receiving uh, confirmation that it was presented to and discussed uh, by the House of Representatives, which it was, that was back in June. So we're now, what's that, July, August, September. We're now in um, Oct We're now in November and I still haven't received a response. So I'm going to be following up there to see how far away uh, that is. Uh, last thing I just wanted to leave you with before we take some comments and questions um, and an exciting, uh, really exciting announcement from my end. Uh, I will be appearing on an upcoming, I did an interview with, Two gents that um, I have a lot of time and respect for. Uh, I'll be appearing on the Really uh, podcast with Tom Wheeler and Dave Foley. Uh, they have only recently launched their podcast and live stream. Uh, the link to their channel is in the show notes below. They're actually in the middle of doing a three-part series with George Knapp. Uh, they've just premiered or aired their first uh, um, part of that three-part series with George Knapp on their uh, their channel and, and Spotify uh, page. So 
Uh, do give that a good listen if you haven't already. Uh, why it's kind of a bit of a, a personal why I'm, I'm a bit personally chuffed is I've been a big fan of Dave Foley ever since I was a, a young fella at school. Uh, those that are children of the the 90s uh, may recall uh, a wonderful sitcom that went from 95, I think, to 2095 to went for a couple of years, uh, news radio. Now, what's interesting about news radio is of all of the individuals, there's an interesting uh, group of, of characters and some really cool um, you know, actors and actresses in that sitcom. But And Phil Hartman, sadly, is no longer with us of um, Saturday, Saturday Night Live alumni. But there are two faces uh, on that news radio graphic that you should recognize. Dave Foley, number one, who is uh, good pals with Jeremy Corbell, is uh, quite engaged on the UAP topic. That's really the focus of their, their podcast, really podcast. And this little fella, this little guy at the, uh, at the bottom, bottom left there, a very young-faced Joe Rogan. So two of these guys from news radio taking the topic very seriously and now uh, obviously advocating for it and, uh, and getting the word out on the street. So uh, really, really thrilled to be uh, appearing on an upcoming episode of really... Uh, and provide some good insights on uh, and perspectives on UAP in an Australian context. So keep a lookout for that. I'll be sure to um, post a link to it on social media when uh, I'm uh, aware of it. So that's pretty much everything that I wanted to cover off on in today's folks. I hope this has been of value. I do want to have a chance to uh, review some of your comments and because I appreciate the time that you have uh, taken to uh opine and 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 comment uh let's just have a look at them that have come through i just want to make ah oh, here we go this is where we pretty much got up to so let's go through a few of them uh uap Aotearoa, um after much public complaint for not having a website phone line or active twitter account aro has gone through the motions it took 11 months and the secure reporting system is <laughs> It's basically a Google form. It is sad. It's tragic. Uh, you know, it makes you wonder, I mean, far out, you know, with a website that could have been whipped up in GoDaddy on no time, um, there's obviously still no approved social media uh, or communications policy in place. Uh, they've put a, a, a web, uh, you know, a Google form on their page that allows uh, current or former members of the U.S. government contractors or uh, you know, service members to report any knowledge, direct knowledge that they have, n not reporting a UFO, UFP sighting, but reporting, reporting knowledge that they have of uh, UAP activity uh, in, a, in a US context. So, yeah, pretty woeful that it's taken that bloody long just to get a basic Google form up and running. I mean, give me a bloody break. Uh, Mark uh, makes a comment. While we're talking about, uh, there we go, uh, Mark McHiggins, let's not forget about Frederick Valentich disappearing over the Bass Strait and what the RAF said to his father. I'm not um, well versed on the Frederick Valentich case. I know that George Simpson has done a ton of great work and authored a really good book, which I haven't had an opportunity yet to read, Called I believe it's called Nothing on Radar. Um, but I would be interested to learn what RAF said to his father. I'm not... Um, I'm not uh, familiar with that. So feel free if you're still on mark to uh, to add that in the chat and I'll bring that up in just a moment. But an interesting case, a fascinating case, the the, the Valentich case. Uh, UAP Altaira using uh, Twitter handle uh, at DOD underscore RO process. You're not allowed to report. That's also a good point. You can't report classified information. It's unclassified info only. That pertains to UAP activity. Um, sightings and counts that happen in the course of your official duties. Uh, and they haven't got a, um, so they haven't got the public reporting system up and uh, up, up and running yet. Apparently that's phase three. So they're only now at phase two. Jimmy, uh, Jimmy's comments, could it be uh, FOI for sole engagement with Australia? Yeah, I can't go after anything that Seoul has produced, but I can certainly go with FOIA. You can only go after products, and when I say products, records or documents that uh, have been produced by the Australian government. So I could certainly go for emails, written correspondence, um, you know, between the Australian Department of Defence or the applicable agency and 
the Soul Foundation, uh, using that as a keyword, or Dr. Gary Nolan, I'd probably use the Soul Foundation. So uh, once the Soul Foundation has had its inaugural conference, and hopefully I have a chance to view the recording if they put it out there in public, that might reveal some breadcrumbs that we can chase through uh, for, for FOIA. Uh, superb water 78 is Australia government just pretending they have no idea what's going on it's a good question publicly they're saying one thing uh, but behind closed doors they could quite possibly be saying something else uh, and again it's very hard to know that because the intelligence community all of the intelligence organizations are exempt from FOIA and if it's uh, you know if Senator Wish Wilson asks a question of the intelligence community, if it's classified and he doesn't have the necessary security classif classification, uh, they're not obligated to give him a response, is my understanding. So as, you know, as, a, as a private citizen, I can't really get anything out of the intelligence community uh, because it is all exempt from FOIA. And yes, it is incredibly so frustrating. Uh, Mark Cometh, there would be a high, very high level in the no. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I my suspicion, and this is just a suspicion, I do suspect that the intelligence community uh, knows a lot more than what the Australian Department of Defence is, what their narrative is at the moment, is that move along, folks, there's nothing to see here. Um um, I don't have any evidence to support that, but I just have a gut feeling that the intelligence community uh, knows a mo lot more than what uh, you know, RAF is saying they don't know publicly. And that's quite possible too, that you know, DOD, and uh, including RAF, maybe don't have any engagement whatsoever on the UAP topic. But why? Defence personnel that are on the front lines uh, the brave women, brave men and women of the Royal Australian Air Force and the Australian Defence Force Services, they're the ones that should have some sensible see something reporting mechanisms at their disposal. They're the ones on the front line observing these things and not feeling comfortable and confident to come forward and tell their superiors about it out of fear of stigma, ridicule, being ostracised, have a blemish added their flight record. That in itself is a potential national security threat. If people aren't feeling comfortable to report stuff that could potentially be foreign adversarial, something that's prosaic but adversarial or something that's exotic, we don't know. But it's, 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 it's uh, vital that they still feel compelled to come forward. Now in the US, it's mandatory reporting. You have to report it. If you see something, you have to say something. It should be the same for, for Australia. Uh, let's move on down. <laughs> with respect to the merch store, uh, Jimmy's waiting for his Penny Wong <laughs> sticker to arrive. It's on its way, Jimmy. Uh, not too long, not much longer for you to wait. Uh, Mark G, welcome from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. With Milwaukee, Wisconsin. If you're still uh, on the live stream, thank you. Thanks for joining, taking some time out of your evening to, to be here. Uh, data derivations, everything Australia has that would go forward with everything Australia has that they would go forward with is likely cited SIGINT related signals intelligence. Yes, which is one of the reasons why I have a suspicion that the Australian Signals Directorate uh, is, you know, has potentially knows uh, about UAP. Uh, some clever strategy to negate this problem is possible. Time for some 3D chess playing. Yes, a very strategic game of chess has been played in the United States, and I suspect it's being played uh, in Australia as well. Uh, Jimmy, very much looking forward to seeing the Ross presentation in Sydney when it's uploaded. I'm looking forward to actually having a, a watch of it again because uh, it's a lot of information just to digest in in uh, you know, a couple of hours. So, and uh, I have the memory of a sieve most uh, <laughs> most days. So, uh, UAP Aotearoa. Uh, uh, yes, Mark G. Um, you asked where people are from. For those that um, don't follow UAP Aotearoa, Colin does some great work uh, across the pond to engage his elected representatives and the New Zealand Defence Force on its lack of interest in and, and engagement on the UAP topic. So consider giving him a follow on uh, on X if you wish. Uh, feel free to drop your handle in the 
in the chat if you so desire, Colin. I'd be happy to uh, to show it. Uh, superb Water 78. People forget that David Grush's boss backed up everything he said too. They always skim over that, but that man is highly decorated. Yes. So remember the debrief article. You had uh, the revelation of Carl Nell backing up uh, David Grush and saying that, um, you know, ba basically vouching for David Grush and, and you know, saying that uh, he believes David Grush to be a credible person and, and everything that he's saying should be uh, taken seriously. I suspect we're going to be hearing a lot more from Carl Nell in the not too distant future. Thank you, Mark. Yes, hit that like button, guys. Please do if you uh, uh, if you want to uh, help the channel grow. Uh, and thank you, Jimmy, for your uh, echoing that sentiment as well, because um, there aren't many other people that are uh, having these kind of discussions on UAP in Australian context. So um, hopefully there will be more over time. So I'm not the only voice that's asking these questions because the more people that ask questions on the topic, I think that um, that helps. Uh, just have a look through some of the other some of the other comments. Ah, oh, what a shame you didn't have a chance to to wish it uh, to to attend the the Sydney event. Short order cook one. Wish I had seen that advertisement. Remember the State Library. So the the event organizers Close Encounters Australia. I don't believe they did any formal advertising. A lot of it was just organic um, social sharing. Like I was made aware of the event. I shared it on my social media, and it sold out pretty quickly. So. Uh, I don't think they felt that there was a need to do a formal advert advertising campaign, and I suspect they may not have had the budget for it anyway. Uh, so it was mainly word of mouth uh, that that, um, that that promoted the event. And yes, Jimmy goes on to say the event with Ross and Victoria was fantastic. I'm sure the Sydney event was even better. Uh, yeah, I think you know very different conversation, which was uh, you know it, it was nice to have slightly different conversation. Mark G, YouTube channel, Project Unity. Yeah, Jay does some great work over there, has several great hour long conversations, interviews with Ross. Uh, do check out Project Unity if you haven't had a look at and listen to his content. He uh, had Oak Shannon uh, on um, some time back, so some interesting revelations pertaining to the Wilson, Davin, Wil Wilson Davis uh, memo. Scottish debunker debunker. I've tried a couple of times to engage with the Australian skeptic community on Twitter over Gimbal, but they haven't responded. Maybe they've got nothing to uh, add to that conversation of value. You can only try. Pat O'Donnell, thanks for your valuable work in this space, Grant. Thank you, Pat, for your kind words. I really appreciate that. Um, short order cook one goes on to continue saying the community seems a little more closed in Australia, even with the UFO disclosure at the forefront. Yeah, it's it's this, it's not a big um, effort down under. It's, you know, obviously one of the things that's frustrating with Australia is Australia has next to no um, event schedule. There's, there's really no conferences in Australia to this, you know, that are of the same caliber of what you see in the United States. And, and obviously the scientific scientific coalition for UAP studies, the SCU in the U S has its annual conference. Uh, Soul foundation is about to have its annual conference. You obviously have a lot of other conferences as well that, uh, you know, fun filled. They have uh, woo factor included. So it's a, it's a really interesting and diverse mix uh, of conferences in the US. Australia's got nothing. I mean, there's a Bardwell UFO conference in in uh, Queensland. Uh, but outside of that, I'm not aware of any other conferences done in Australia. So that's why it was so refreshing to, uh, you know, attend these events that we'll put on uh, with with Ross and Q&A because there's a great chance to hear from Ross directly and, and, and ask questions of him directly as well. Uh, oh, Alien Girl 111. Amy, thank you so much for joining, my friend. I uh, really appreciate you joining me late uh, in the day on your side. Uh, love your work as well, Amy. So thank you, darling, for uh, for your kind words. Um, Melissa states Kirkpatrick is leaving, isn't he? Well, that's what's the rumor at the moment, that he is on the out. And that if you read the Daily Mail... Uh, think of what you will of the Daily Mail, but if you read the recent article that 
it's been rumored that you've got four candidates that have been shortlisted or well, there have been discussions with potentially four candidates on uh, a potential replacement to Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick, who's either, the rumor is that he's either going to resign a planned resignation if he was only you know, committed to a short tenure with ARA um, or he's being pushed out. It'll be, and that's why I say it'd be very interesting to <laughs> hear what questions are asked of Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick at that upcoming Hayden Center uh, in person and virtual uh, conference. Uh, Chili Farm Brisbane makes a comment. Question, did you guys chat about CSIRO uh, Defence Science and Technology Group at dinner? I had some brief conversations um, with Bill Chalker on it, but nothing of... Uh, and it's really probably more of just of a historical context. Um, I'll be honest, I'd had a few beers, so I probably couldn't remember all of the conversations that were had. But no, nothing, nothing of um, nothing significant to retell. I mean, I, I was really in Bill's ear uh, the whole night, or, or for a large portion of the night, just um, picking his brain on a lot of the great research he's done over the years on. Uh, UAP cases in uh, in Australia because um because Bill you know and and Ross Coulthard and his book in plain sight he uh, he consulted Bill Chalker quite a lot on on his research so both uh, Bill Chalker and Keith Basterfield I consider to be uh, two true gems uh, in the research community on UAP and Australian uh, topic and 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 value their uh, their um, their counsel guidance and, and friendship as well. Uh, let's have a look at some of the other comments and questions that have come through. Short order cook one. Michael Salah did an interview with Ron James recently Said the who said those that don't want disclosure are working just as hard not to let anything out and confusing the issue. Yeah, I, I, I would say that the, the gate, gatekeepers within the U.S. Department of Defense and the U.S. intelligence community are working. I mean, if you hear, if you listen and, and you know, take note of what's been said by uh, Ross Coulthard, by David Grush, by those that, you know, have a network of sources within uh, Christopher Mellon, within DOD and the IC, that there is a, um, a big pushback to put the toothpaste back in the tube. But I don't think there's any... I don't think there's any stopping this train now. I think it's um, hopefully hopefully a matter of time and in uh, our uh, in our lifetime. Sure, it'll cook one. All it makes me think is that Australia and New Zealand have something to hide, or their involvement is substantial. Yeah, it's I I don't know. I'm perplexed on, and I, I talk about this with um, Tom Wheeler and Dave Foley on the Really podcast. So I won't. Um, give away my 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 thoughts there but uh chance for you to watch the episode um but yeah i talk about that briefly with them because that comes up in um in conversation uh, mark g uh, remote viewing i agree it works quantum entanglement it's interesting how the paranormal and ufos are connected skinwalkers scare the shit out of me. Uh, remote viewing is is uh, a topic i find fascinating i haven't dived into it and if um, uh, Salvatore Paez was on a live stream, uh, only, I think it was yesterday and, um, on, uh, you know, irrespective of what you think of the work that he's doing, just, um, ex Ashton. So Ashton Forbes, um, had Salvatore, um, and for those of you that don't know, Ashton Forbes is, uh, on social media, uh, doing a lot of research on the um, MH370 um, disappearance. So uh, I'm obviously, uh, that's not a topic that I've um, explored. My only engagement with Ashton Forbes was, uh, you know, great, good on you for doing, uh, investing as much time, energy and effort as you have into this topic that interests you. Have you had any of your data and your hypotheses peer reviewed? Uh, and uh, I think he's engaging some folks within the scientific and academic community, but I don't believe he's had any peer review of his data as of yet. That said, uh, the interview that he 
had with Salvatore Paez is is actually really interesting. You know, Salvatore Paez is the individual that uh, authored these Navy patents a com- couple of years ago that you know, are really, really quite um, fascinating and interesting. And the, if you look at the patents themselves, one is a triangle uh, that looks like an electrogravitic craft, and you know, there's a lot of controversy over his patents. But it's a it's a really good interview. Um, he's a very, very smart man. And uh, I had to consult uh, the Oracle, Google a few times to understand what he was saying. But um, it's, uh, it's, it's an interesting, interesting interview just from that because he talks about uh, quantum entanglement does come up uh, in at least one of his talking points with respect to what he's working on calls the uh, – he positions there being a super force that, um, you know, ties in with – quantum quantum entanglement um yeah so that's what i've been saying short order cook so there are only four eyes there sorry bad joke four of the five eyes or three potentially of the five eyes because we don't know what uh, the uk's the uk's they're pretty much been completely mum on their attendance or non-attendance at the five eyes forum on uh, on uap Ross McLeod, Dave Foley is terrific on the topic. Look forward to the interview. Thank you, Ross. Yes, I, I got a lot of time for uh, Dave and uh, and Tom. I uh, really love what they're doing with their podcast, and they're very engaged on topic and asking some um, some good questions. Mark G just subscribed. A really good one. Yeah, the, the great great interview with uh, uh, Michael Masters was one that they also um, interviewed recently, and obviously George Knapp. They've put part one of their three part series. So. Looking forward to seeing part two and three um, get released soon. Uh, let's have a look at some of the other. Yes, indeed, we don't. Short order cook one. We don't have a great reporting system in Australia. Well, when it comes to UAP, we've got none. So, Australian Department of Defence, nada. Uh, Civil Civil Aviation Safety Authority, CASA, NADA. Air Services Australia, NADA. That's air traffic control. No one has any reporting mechanisms in place for UAP. I certainly agree with you. Bill Chalker is an absolute legend here. The older newsletters are online. Yes, so Bill Chalker and both uh, Bill Chalker and Keith Basterfield have a wonderful blog. Uh, Keith Bast, uh, Bill Chalker authored a, a book a number of years ago called The Oz Files, looking at a lot of Australian cases. His online blog goes by the same name, The Oz Files. So if you type in Bill Chalker and The Oz Files in Google, you'll get a a match uh, in, you know, maybe on the second page, I believe, but really good uh, online blog. Uh, Keith Basterfield, also absolute legend uh, and veteran researcher. He also has uh, a blog. So if you type in both of their names in a Google, uh, actually, I might add the links to uh, the show note descriptions after we exit this session. So, uh, yeah, do check out Bill Chalker and Keith Bassfield's work if you haven't already done it, done so. As as Jimmy says, they're um, they're absolute legends. So, thank you, Colin. We appreciate your comments. Thank you for all you do, Grant. I appreciate your kind words. Uh, and he goes on to say, FOIA in New Zealand is what I do, but the results are frustrating. And uh, I I feel your pain, brother. It's very much we're in the same boat. Short of cook one, I had to send my UAP footage to MUFON USA to verify footage. Australian MUFON didn't handle it. Interesting. Um, yeah. If you haven't had any engagement with Roger Stankovic, uh, short order cook one, maybe reach out to him on Twitter because he has a long affiliation with MUFON ANZ. Uh, perhaps you've already had engagement with him, I'm not too sure, but maybe the, there isn't a capacity uh, for uh, ANZ to, um, to handle it. I know that Roger has looked at some footage that's been provided to him that's, um, you know, Australian source. So I don't know, maybe worth a, worth engagement if you're if you're interested. But look, that is everything, folks. Man, we've gone way over the time that I anticipated for uh, <clears throat> for this this uh, this live stream, and that looks like it was Roger that you had engaged with. So fair call. Maybe there just wasn't the. Uh, capacity or bandwidth to, um, to, to for move on Australia to explore it. Thank you, Mark G. I really appreciate you joining me for this session. Thank you all for taking some time out of your 
Tuesday in Australia or Monday evening if you're uh, across the pond. Uh, public holiday down here in Melbourne. We have uh, the the um, Melbourne Cup Day, our the, the the when the nation stops for a couple of minutes for a horse race. Don't even get me started on horse race. Uh, but I appreciate the time that you have uh, taken out of your day to listen to what I have to share. Uh, hope this content, as always, is of value. Uh, look forward to uh, joining you on a future episode of the Unexplained Rundown and hope you enjoy the rest of your week. So thanks again for your folks. Thanks, thanks for your time, folks. Appreciate it. If you have enjoyed this episode of the Unexplained Rundown, please consider giving it a thumbs up, sharing with your friends, family, colleagues, and social network, as well as subscribing to the channel. And if you'd like to be notified whenever the Unexplained Rundown goes live, premieres or posts a new video, be sure to ring that cowbell.